Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, From Neurology to Neuromorphic Chips, with special guest, Dr. Pamela Follett, neurologist and co-founder of Lewis Broads Labs. Pamela, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Hey, Pamela, you and I had a great opportunity to meet at Cyber Tech Summit two or three weeks ago. We had a great conversation and your background. I just I was just enamored with your background and your story and everything. And I knew my podcast listeners would love to hear your story. So, Pamela, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and uh, we'll get we'll, we'll talk about it. OK, um, let's see. Well, my background um I, I actually started in engineering and, and then with a brief stint in um, uh, medical systems at General Electric, uh, I walked in a hospital and said, oh my goodness, I need to work here and <laughs> went, to, uh, went on to, to medical training. <laughs> um, and um, I, I went through uh, child neurology and I became a child neurologist. And then I got very enamored with basic neuroscience research and understanding the, um, the uh, developing brain in um, early, really early childhood, so pre preterm and, and around term infants. And when they had a, an injury um, and who did well and who didn't, and I spent a good deal of time studying that in uh, in the lab with rat models and uh, cell cultures, and then and then trying to understand the children that I saw in the in the clinic. So, so that brings up something interesting because you did the research, but you also worked with children at the same time. So you were still a, 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 a practicing um, clinician, right, with children working through the issues that they were dealing with. Yes, right? I was at uh, Children's Hospital in Boston and um, they have a there's an entity called clinician scientist, which is a, a, a physician, clinical physician who also does basic either basic or clinical research. But um, I was doing basic research in the lab and then would also do clinic. It was delightful. So you did it yeah, yeah, this is really fascinating to me because my my oldest son has Asperger's syndrome. So we met with neurologists, we met with psychologists, we met with everybody to try and figure out what was going sure, on <laughs> back in the nineties. Uh, yeah, it did. Yeah, it and it, it took some time for them to figure this thing out. So I'm, I've always been fascinated with neurology, especially pediatric or child neurology, and I get to talk to a real brain person, right? Yeah. Um, which is different than a, a, um, um, a neurosurgeon, right? You're very different than a neurosurgeon. Right. The um, neurosurgeon, um, yeah, does surgery, and I do not do surgery. Um, so neurosurgeons um, can, like, uh, fix um, fix some things, but in the nervous system, it's tough. Um, take a child born with spina bifida. You need a neurosurgeon to repair the um, the uh, injury to the spine where it didn't develop quite right. Um, but then they're done. And then you need a neurologist to help with the child development and help the child get their optimal outcome out of the body that they ended up with. But the service is, is that, can't really fix a lot of neurology. Is, is that because uh, neurologists really focus on process and the interaction inside the brain, what's really, how things are actually really working. Cause it's really this nebulous type of thing to me. I I'm like completely fascinated, um, by, by the whole thing, but understanding it, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to a brainiac, obviously. So the, the, um, the most delightful thing, well, there are a lot of delightful things, but the most delightful thing about being a child neurologist is that, um, you don't ever know that you have limits. Um, because you don't really know what's going to happen during development. And so even when there's a catastrophe, 
you can you can you can hope. And yeah, there are some that it's that that make it really tough. But it's remarkable, even with the same set of catastrophe circumstances, just how stunningly well some children manage to overcome. And it's because their brains aren't static. It's not just that they're a little adult learning stuff, okay? And they have a huge amount to learn to become an adult. That's not it. When they're born, their, their brain isn't there yet. It's, it's not just a little adult brain. It's a, a, a developing brain. And, and so when something bad happens to it, it can respond in ways that overcome a lot of the things. And, and that's, that, that, has a, that has a joy and a hope to it um, that, that you don't have with the same injury in an adult. Um, an adult has a massive stroke that takes out half of their brain and all of their speech and, and, and they're devastated. And they might get some of that back, but you know that that was brain and, and that brain is now not there. When a child has that very exact same stroke when they're born, which happens, the same, the same um, blood vessel territory can have a stroke in an in, and a newborn during that day that it's born. You might not even know that the child had a stroke. Wow. And some children do so well overcoming it while their, the rest of their brain just overcomes it. And they do so well that some weird thing will happen when they have a bike accident at age 14 and that somebody will do a scan and say, oh my goodness, they had a stroke when they were born. And, and that's how well some children do. And wouldn't it be- So, and that's what you were, that's what you were studying, right? You were studying, why did kids do so well? Yeah. And then some kids didn't. So you were looking at what, what made them overcome these injuries or you, you call them insults. insults. Right? <laughs> yeah, because it, 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 injury is a funny word. Um, it, it, it's yeah, very it meaningful in an adult, but it's, it, it does, we don't necessarily have it all nailed down exactly what happened. Sometimes that insult uh, causes um, a lot of inflammation. Well, is that an injury? Well, it's the result of an insult, but I don't really know what to call that. So yeah, I took, I call I call all things that that look like seizure spells because I don't really know what they are until I see them, um, and uh, and and so, but they're all spells, right? And all things that hurt the brain are insults because I'm not predeciding what what happened. What caused it? Yeah, yeah, it, very very interesting. I love the terms. I'm going to start using them. <laughs> Um, my wife's going to, it's going to drive her crazy, but that, that's one of the reasons why I'll start using it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Pamela, I met you at a show. First off, why is a neuro or neurologist at a high tech show? Uh, this didn't make any sense to me when I first talked to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, didn't, didn't make any sense to me either. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we had a, uh, a medical emergency early on, and I met an EMT over a, over a gentleman having a seizure, and he saw me at uh, Worldwide Technologies booth and said, "What do you do for Worldwide Technologies?" <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you actually see, you actually saved this guy, right? Or you helped him get through a seizure, um, right? Yeah, the poor gentleman had a, a seizure during uh, the keynote address, and um, and uh, our friend from Intel knew I was there and called me over, and uh, yeah, we were able to make make him feel better at least safely, and. Um, it was very entertaining for me because normally when I go to conferences, there are 200 physicians there. And the last thing I would want to do would volunteer to do anything because there's a whole lot of people probably more qualified than me because it's usually not children that are at uh, conferences. But in right. this particular case, I was I was the best game in town. <laughs> Well, that's kind of, that's kind of cool. So is that why you, is that why you're trolling all of these uh, tech conferences is so that um, you can help people out and they have emergency? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So, no, so why, so why were you there in so the first place? I was place? there because I, um, I have put on a different hat and I um, play neuroscientist for a high-tech startup that does neuromorphic computing. But um, at the moment, there isn't a lot of neuroscience to do because we have a product. And when you work with a high-tech startup, you do whatever job needs to be done. And so I have found that there are a lot of skills that one has from, um, say, talking to patients who have a medical problem that they need to understand, but they didn't actually do four years of medical school and five years of residency, and maybe they shouldn't have to have to take care of their child. So I need to be able to explain to them what's wrong and we need to be a team. And I deeply believe that and, um, and I've always tried to do that as well as I could. But I find that that's not a bad skill when you're trying to explain a difficult technology to people who really just need to be able to use it and they really don't care um, well, how the processor works. And so it's kind of fun to find skills that you had in one space show up as useful in another space. Well, well before you, you made a big leap. <laughs> you just said... You just said, hey, I, I just switched over. No, no, no. There's a whole story around that. The research, yeah, the research that you did in understanding um, uh, brain development or neurological development um, and, and when there's insult to that early brain and the ones that succeeded, that research that you did led into the startup yeah. of this company. Yes, Is that right? Yes, that's right. That's what happened. I, um, I was, um, I, I may have mentioned to you, I was working on an animal model and I had a culture model and I was trying to um, insult my, my, little, my little rats <laughs> and um, so that I could um, understand uh, this brain recovery. And, um, and I was complaining um, at home because one does that when one works one has to go home and complain about things. Well, that's what, that's where we, we decompress, right? right? With and our spouse. I was complaining oh. about um, the limitations um, that I had with these model systems um, and how difficult it was to see the developmental change from one thing. I could um, put my little rats in difficult circumstances, but I could give them low oxygen, for example, and then lots and lots of things happen, right? And the whole system gets in trouble and rats are remarkable things and they recover really well, but does that necessarily mean anything to what children are doing? And, and I couldn't change just one thing. And I was complaining about this because I, I wanted to understand the, the little subtleties that, that were the difference between success and failure from a brain recovery standpoint. And uh, you mentioned, you alluded earlier to my husband being um, part of this venture. And he was the one listening to me complain. And he happened to have, he happens to be an entrepreneur and he was in the middle of nothing and was bored. And he said, huh, how about a computer model? And so he developed a, a simulator for me that of developing neurons, where you set up a field of neurons and then you could give them parameters and they would interconnect and then i could change one thing and then they would interconnect a little differently and then i could um do it briefly and then over time see what happened and how changes and we developed this model and it was really fun and really interesting and i learned a lot about things that were critical in um in in this um like really specific things that were critical. And, and we took that information, or he did, he said, huh, as I kept explaining to him what I was learning, and I kept explaining to him why I thought what he was seeing was wrong, because I do that a lot. <laughs> Even when he's right, I, I tend to do it a lot. And, <laughs> um, and, and we wrestled with this a great deal. And then one day he says, you know, I think we could make a computer chip out of this, what you've learned. And I said, go for it. 
I'm not interested. And I went back to my, um, my science and he called up Sandia National Labs, who had worked with previously, um, and said, would you be interested in a neuromorphic processor that looked at life like this? And they were interested. Um, and they thought there was an application in cybersecurity. And we were off and running, well, often crawling and often walking. And, and eventually we got running. <laughs> yeah, a typical startup life, right? Actually, we ran backwards quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, 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 that sounds familiar too. <laughs> so you, you took the fundamental research you were doing to help children yeah. or to understand children and, and maybe even help them if they did have a, a neonatal or a developing brain injury. And you've, you've created this incredible technology um, that simulates the brain, a neuromorphic chip. Yep. Right? Yeah. Um, pre pretty yeah, cool. That's pretty cool. That, that's, that's not just starting a start, going, moving to a startup. <laughs> now, well, that, this, is pretty, this is pretty awesome stuff. It's been a ride. <laughs> Now let's explain a little bit about what your the product does that you did with Sandia, and it's called Extreme Search. Um, really interesting uh, concept that you guys have here. Yeah, so so when we started, um, we started with the ideas that um, that people had brought to computers um, from the brain, um, and um, and I equated to the to the way people started to fly. Um, when, when the early planes, there was a belief that the, the wings had gone down. We had to flap our wings. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And because it needed to look as much like a bird as possible in order to get the idea that we could get a human up in it, right? Well, no, right? That, that turned out to be wrong. What we needed to do was understand flight better and then pick very careful things from flight, right? And, and, and then stationary wings and, and, you know, and then all of the things that have made flight better have not looked more like birds, right? Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. And, and when I, when we started um, with the processor and people would say, well, talk about how it needs to look like a brain. I said, well, you know, if we have a computer that looks like a brain, it's going to be a computer that makes thousands of mistakes a day because that's what brains do. Brains recognize and iterate and, and, and think and make mistakes and correct and make mistakes. And, and, and if you think about how you see a shadow in the corner of your bedroom at night um, and, and you can see and convince yourself of something completely different than what's there so easily when you recognize a person across a room and you're, you're not seeing that person. You're always doing this with your brain. That's, but we don't really want our computers to do that. At least, no, at we least don't. Not when, you, <laughs> when I hit my, you know, G-R-E-A-T on my, on my, I don't want the computer to think about which letters I'm at. You know, when, and when my phone does that, it gets pretty annoying. So, right? Yes, it does. So there yeah. are places for this, but, but we found that in, particularly in cybersecurity, which is what we're looking at, you don't want mistakes. You don't want any mistakes, right? So we stripped out all of the pieces of our uh, uh, down all of the pieces of our of our chip down to the the, the critical features that allowed uh, of the brain that allowed it to function the way we need. And the pieces that we hung on to were the extremely high performance at very low power in a constant throughput manner. So I can walk you through that a little bit. So you can think really, really hard and your brain doesn't catch on fire, right? Yeah, yeah, you that's may, true. You may burn a bit more energy, but it's really fairly negligible. Your brain can work on very, very high um, performance on, you know, on a good day, right? Um, but it, it, but it, it doesn't generate, it is a real cap on the heat that it generates and it never goes above that, all right? It also, me, it yeah. also works yeah. in real time, right? You don't, you don't buffer what you're seeing and what you're hearing and process it later like a computer does. You do it in real time. 
you do what you do and you might miss something, but, but it's a real time. So, you know, when you, when you have a 10 second span of time, you have processed all of the input on that 10 seconds. You don't have a choice, right? And you do all of this at, again, at extremely low power. So you have a constant throughput, high performance and low power. Those are the features of the brain that we stole. And, I love and, it. and by, I love by it. eliminating all of the learning is mistakes. And so we couldn't afford any mistakes. So we got, we just, we just put that aside for smarter people than us and, and just stuck to the things that, that were really needed for the processor that we were after. And then we developed a processor that could just go through data blazingly fast and get to the other side and tell you what was there. So you need to find something that shouldn't be in your petabyte of data. And 12 minutes later, we'll tell you if it was there. And that's it. That's the only thing we do. We do one thing and we do it very well. So that's what I really like that approach because that's hard for a startup. I know because I've done three. And, and you, you say at the beginning, I'm going to be focused. But then you're like, ooh, I can make some money over there and I'm not making money yet. So I need to I need to make some money. So I love that you guys have been so focused on this um, extreme search, which which you, you kind of alluded to a little bit, which is I can find anything in my data. And, and we're not talking structured data. This is unstructured data. I can find anything in that unstructured data, a petabyte in 12 yep. minutes, right? As long as it's, as long as it's on, a, on a server uh, that, that has the uh, extreme search software and hardware, um, your, it searches your SSD storage locally right there in the storage. So you don't have to be moving data around because a lot of the, a lot of the problems, if you alluded to the, uh, the structure and things and structuring data is obviously a problem. Anyone who does it knows it's, 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 it's time consuming and it takes a lot of storage just to hold your indexes, et cetera, right? But that, that's only one of the problems. The other problem is you have to move the data around. By having a really low power high performance processor, we can put it right next to the storage. So the data doesn't have to move. And when the data doesn't have to move, all of the network bottlenecks go away. All of the searching from a distance goes away. All of the, all your data's at the edge problem, that's fine. You can just look at it wherever you are. Wherever, wherever it is. Because as long as it's sitting in that storage, we can tell you if you need to worry about it. So, so what you guys have delivered is a, is a storage appliance. Yeah. That is that is searchable. That searches itself. It searches itself, which is pretty incredible because today, if I need to search large like log files, and, and that's why you guys went after um, yeah. cybersecurity first was because they deal with a whole bunch of textual log files, terabytes and terabytes up to petabytes of data. Mm -hmm. and And what happens today is I... But what do I do? I use something like Spark to search for things. I use Elasticsearch to search for things. Yeah, and, and you try to solve the indexing problem of the fact that you can't really index things you don't know beforehand what you're going to want. Yeah, so so there you go. That I think that's key. You guys can do ad hoc searches. These are not pre. No. These are not pre patterns that you've already identified. These are like ad hoc searches of patterns in your data. Anything you can describe with a regular expression. That's that's incredible. And it's not a it's not a it's not a um, a uh, um, a whole new language to learn. It's two Python commands. <laughs> it's it's not you know there's no there's no courses for uh, for users or anything else. It, it's it's very simple, straightforward. Two line, two line, command lines. So, so uh, what what would people use use this technology for? We we mentioned cybersecurity, but what in cybersecurity would I use this for? I'm not using this to do detection, am I? Well, so 
That's a dicey question because you know people in cybersecurity they don't talk much. About no, they that. don't. Yeah, they. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. I've noticed but, that. Too. But um, what we can glean, um, we figured that cyber forensics was going to be our sweet spot because um, uh, we kind of originally introduced a product in um, um, right after Solar Winds attack, and. And when people were realizing that they had been um, infected for eight or nine months, right? Or a year and, and a were, half or two And they years, were yeah. sifting through and they couldn't find the, you know, they just couldn't find because there was so much data pulling it out of cold storage and search, and then it would take, you know, the iterations were literally taking weeks, months to get through to find the, the beginning, right? To find the extent, right? So we thought, okay, we are sweet in cyber forensics. Um, you just, you know, you can have a, a, a chunk of storage, depending on how much data you need, and you just dump it on there, you search it as much as you need to, you can use it, you know, you can re recover, you can, and, and we figured that cyber forensics was our sweet spot. And, um, and we were talking about it that way. And, and, and we weren't wrong. I mean, that is, um, but then we have found our customers approach um, we were told over and over again, oh, no, that's not what we're using you for. You're much more valuable in real time um, really? as, a, as, a, as a hot buffer where the, we, we ingest, but we just dump everything in, into the ext our extreme search boxes and have many week, you know, a handful of weeks of everything. And then when we get caught, which is happening you know, daily these days, Right, multiple times daily, we can just we can check, we can make sure, we can search, we can find what file we have to worry about in this mass. Well, so it's it's not deep forensics; it's like real time forensics. It's so so they and and the longer the the boxes have been, um, the appliances have been in use. Um, the the I mean, these people that won't talk to us that do cyber for a living. They're really smart, <laughs> oh, yeah. and you know, the longer they have um, their hands on on a tool, the the more uses they found, and um, then and they get really excited, not telling us things. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, um, <laughs> could, could you see this being used in other type of like research? I mean, you're a researcher, so I, I was just thinking it just popped into my head. I could see where this could be used in genomic research. This could be used. I mean, if, if things are stored as text, um, mm -hmm. I can search for all different types of patterns. Um, and, yeah. and even, even maybe even drug interaction and, and a whole bunch of different things, as long as I have things, cause you guys, you're not doing search on images or uh, you're, you're searching on, Yes. So we can search metadata. So if you have okay, so massive yeah. numbers of images and they've been tagged, but you still can't find anything because there's so many of them. Yeah, yeah. There's then, then we can search the metadata. So there's a space there. Um, you know, there's an interesting question between the structure and the unstructure. So you asked about you know research and look, and and it's it really comes down to the type of data that people are are drowning in. Um, if if you have, um, no matter how big it is, if you have a structured database and you have indexes for um, everything that you need to know, we, we have really little to add to that. Yeah, but I, I, I think I find it fascinating. A lot of times we don't know what we don't know. That is where I was going. <laughs> you are, okay, good, yeah. Exactly. So let's say that you... Um, that you've collected all the electronic medical records. And there's a lot of uh, this, just because that's the si one side of things that I've seen. And that's a, a lot of structured data because when you add it into the database, you're adding, but in there is also a whole lot of things that really don't fit within any sort of structure. So as long as you only need what you knew you would be looking for, then you're fine. But what if you want to go back into your database of anonymized records and look for a pattern that you're starting to wonder might be there? 
it's not necessarily going to be in your structured data. And this isn't just true in healthcare. This is going to be true in everything from sensor data to oil plots. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I can oil see plots. this in... Right. And anywhere where you've, you've been surviving on, on the ability to structure your data, um, and even if the amount of it isn't overwhelming that yet, you, you, don't, you have a lack of resolution because anything you didn't acknowledge ahead of time, you have to search through way too much data to find it in a reasonable amount of time. So you don't add labels and, you, and you're trying to do machine learning, but you're limited to what you already knew, right? And so, and so yeah, the ability to dump data that, that's, that's opaque it, um, and, and search it is a clear fit. But then the ability to reassess and re-index data that you have, have black spots on. Okay, you have, you have just opaque areas where if you didn't know ahead of time you were going to be interested, the text of your medical, of your, of your notes, um, something that got transcribed, um, things that were imaged with metadata, uh, all sorts of things, you know, from a, from a healthcare standpoint. But this is true all over. If you, it, whatever you didn't think, didn't know you were going to need, um, can be sitting in there invisible. And, and so any time that's kind of a nudgy problem. That yeah. fits perfect for you guys. That so when I, use, when I use extreme search in conjunction with structuring my data, I, did, does that make sense? Can I use them together and yeah. say, I'm going to, I think this is something. And then I type it in an extreme search and, and I get back tons of data and I'm like going, Holy cow! I should index now on that. Yeah. So, Is it, do you see that working together? Yeah. So we would never tell anybody to get rid of what what they have that's working. Gotcha. You just add extreme search, and the, how the, how much of it depends on how big your data problem is, right? But you just add it beside, and then. You can make copies of the data, or you can put the data you weren't sure about that you would ever need, but it's still pretty recent because the I, I say data is not like a fine wine; it does not improve with age. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it gets less and less useful. So, so you can um, use it beside something that you might want to gain visibility on. You can use it to bring in new things that you might want to look at differently, but you put it beside. So it will, anything that's, any analysis, any analytics that start with search, which these days is most of them, can go faster if you can pre-sort your data into the pieces that you need. And so we can do that for, for a system that you already have, a software languages that you're already using, some of these fabulous programs that are out there that help people manage their, their PCAP and their logs and their this is and their that. We don't do any of that. We just tell you where it is. Pamela, this is wonderful technology. Where do people find out more about um, Extreme Search and, and what you guys have to offer? Well, they can start with our website. Um, it's uh, www. Lewis, actually, it isn't anymore, is it? It's just Lewis, Lewis-Roads.com. All right, Lewis-Roads.com. Uh, that's where they can uh, get information on the product. Pamela, as always, I enjoy talking to you. A wonderful podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.